All right, so I'm super excited about this next piece. Um, we are going to, we have a wonderful panel of folks here who are actively working in medical respite programs. So we're gonna take some time to be able to learn from them, hear about their programs, experiences, and our goal is after they have some time to share about their programs, we'll actually have some more time for questions from you and from you all in the audience here. So um, I am super thrilled um, to introduce Mary, Lita, I'm sorry, I'm like, <laughs> you guys are out of order on my thing, I was like, no. And then Brandon Cook, this is not Julia Gaines, this is Brandon Cook who's stepping in for us today. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and I will start with Mary. If you could for me just introduce yourself and your program a little bit for us. Hi everybody, my name is Mary Lowe and I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work with United Healthcare at Christ House, which is a homeless medical respite for men experiencing homelessness in the District of Columbia. We have 33 beds at our facility, and we're a 24-7 facility um, with wraparound medical and support services for our patients. Hi, my name is Lita Davis. Um, I'm the program director and a clinical social worker at Joseph's House, which is also in Washington, D.C. Hold on, I'm sorry. Is the... Does this... Is this louder? Is this different? Okay, great. Um, okay, to start over, my name is Lita Davis. I'm the program director and a clinical social worker at Joseph's House, um, which is a medical respite bed program in Washington, D.C. Um, we are a smaller medical respite bed. We max out at eight beds. Um, and we also have a pretty specific um, medical criteria. Um, primarily working with folks who, are, um, who have HIV or AIDS or terminal cancer. Um. Uh, so as Caitlin said, I, I am not Julia. My name, <laughs> my name is Brandon Cook. I'm the healthcare for the homeless medical respite director at New Horizon Family Health Services, uh, based out of Greenville, South Carolina. Um, our program is much like Lita's, pretty small. Um, we have ten beds, uh, and we are a shelter-based model. And uh, we didn't do it on purpose, but we stole one of your employees down in Greenville. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I had to throw that in there real quick. She knows who I'm talking about. All right, sorry. Next. That's okay. You can, you can keep the microphone since you started chatting about your program a little bit. So if you want to share kind of some details about how your program works and what a typical day in the program looks like for the clients who are in it. Yeah, so because we're uh, a shelter-based program, uh, we do have a set of criteria uh, to come into the program. Uh, we, we really work very hard uh, with our shelter providers or our shelter partners um, to really kind of navigate that as carefully as we can. We don't want to upset our host, um, but we also want to ensure that we're taking folks in who are most appropriate. Um, we do share that information uh, with the hospital discharge planners. Uh, there are two um, fairly large hospital systems uh, in our little community in Greenville, Prisma Health and St. Francis. Um, uh, uh, so it's 10 beds. Uh, there are six beds for men at the men's emergency shelter. So that means there's four beds for women at the women's emergency shelter. Um, and uh, the current staffing is a nurse, I have to shout him out, Nurse <laughs> Levi. Um, and this is his first conference and his first PCI, so yay. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, we, we call them care advocates, but essentially a case manager slash social worker uh, to work with those uh, those non-medical resources that the patients might need. Um, what else? Is that it? Um, anything that sort of clients do throughout ah, the day. Yes. Typical day in the life. Um, so really what we do is we try to ensure that the patients stay engaged with their, um, not only with their primary, we connect them to primary care and then we ensure that they stay engaged with their follow-up care from the hospital. So. If someone came to us with an orthopedic issue, we're going to make sure that they're staying engaged with that. We're going to cover the transportation for that. Um, technically, uh, a lot of them, some of them, 
do qualify for our regular HCH grant dollars, so we cover a lot of services that way. Um, Levi and I were talking earlier, it seems like we are finding a number of patients that do have insurance, so that's helpful um, to relieve some of that, that cost burden on us. We are in a non-expansion state, so, and the hospitals are gracious enough to supply us kind of, sort of, with referrals, but not any um, dollars. So we are paying for this out of our own funding as of right now, which is why we only have 10 beds. Um, some of the things that we try to do, um, which we would like to be a little bit more consistent, is finding some recreational stuff for, uh, for our folks to do to add to their uh, recuperative care process. We have done things like uh, art, art therapy uh, with one of our community partners. Um, we have also done things like take them to the museum, but just putting together a more um, consistent plan for that. And essentially, that's the, the, the staff. They check on the folks uh, on a fairly regular basis. They work very closely with them. The patient uh, is at the center uh, of what we do. So uh, we're not telling them what to do. We're walking alongside them. And so for us, that's the best way to do it. And I will pass it along. Um, so Joseph's House has been in operation since 1990. Um, and when we were founded, we were founded um, to serve uh, folks with HIV and AIDS who are receiving end-of-life care. Um, so one of the things about our program is that we've um, done a lot of adjustments over time um, because treatment options have changed tremendously. So we were founded really as a hospice program and then over time um, became a medical respite program. And there have been a lot of adjustments to that process. We retain um, some of our hospice roots, working with both end-of-life care for folks with AIDS as well as for folks with terminal cancer. Um, as I mentioned, we're a very small program. Um, one thing that we've got that's, I think, quite helpful is um, most of our beds are single, most of our rooms are single occupancy. So that gives us a great deal of flexibility around um, providing space for folks of all genders. Um, as well as kind of meeting some of that trauma-informed care needs that folks might have of being able to be really flexible and adjust to individual um, preferences and individual choices. Um, so we are able to accept individuals of all genders. We've been doing that for um, a number of years now. Um, we have um, two full-time nurses. When we're fully staffed, we are currently hiring for a full-time nurse, if there's anyone interested. Um, <laughs> I promised that I would plug that while I was here. Um, and we have a full-time social worker. Um, you guys heard from Tony and Sarah earlier today, and they mentioned the importance of the volunteers that we have that come in. Um, so we work with um, Lutheran Volunteer Corps, Jesuit Volunteer Corps, and the Washington AIDS Partnership that provide long-term volunteers that provide care and support to the individuals at Joseph's House. Um, and then we also have care aides that provide a lot of hands-on care. Um, and the individual treatment needs of the folks staying with us vary tremendously from being um, folks who are bedbound and need um, a lot of support around ADLs to people who are really pretty independent. Um, one of the things that's unusual about Joseph's house is we've got a more extended stay than many other med medical respite bed programs. We start at a 90 day and then we often extend from there. Um, so we're looking at um, stabilizing. We've got a little bit more scope in terms of time um, for connecting to um, wraparound services. Um, and then another piece that is a little bit distinctive about Joseph's house is that we continue to provide support to folks after they've left um, the community. So um, part of that, we do have nine um, permanent supportive housing units in DC, uh, and we provide ongoing case management support to them. That's um, where Tony is connected to us. And then we also provide ongoing support to other individuals who might be li living in scatter site locations around the community. Um, so on a typical day, um, it really, being small is great because we can be really flexible to individual preferences. So it will range quite a bit. Um, they'll have time to meet with the social worker, to work towards goals. They'll probably have some appointments. We accompany 
residents to all of their appointments and provide them with transportation. Um, we'll have regular community <coughs> meetings that might range from um, topics around health, um, topics around goals, but also just maybe going down to the park and playing cornhole together or doing a karaoke party that someone mentioned as well, um, celebrating holidays and milestones. Um, we are really small, so it's hard to provide a lot of day-to-day -day programming. So we're also looking, we're, we try to partner with other organizations in the community that are providing day programs and things like that to give more access to structured um, groups and art therapy and things like that. Um, but having the community members be a part of Joseph's house is really helpful too because we have folks coming in who are at very different stages of recovery and spending time together and kind of creating that network of folks that care about and support one another and their health. I think I'll start by saying that Christ House gets referrals from all over the city. We get them from hospitals, usually through case management offices, um, sometimes folks walk in off the street through our partnership with different clinics, different pr practitioners will refer people in and we get a lot of calls from moms and aunts as well um, to refer folks in. People also self-refer in. The average length of stay is 33 days. Um, a lot of times as a practitioner, I actually find that one of my jobs when I get in the room is to explain to the patient what medical respite is. And so I like to say, it's not quite a hospital, it's not quite a house, it's not quite a homeless shelter. It's a weird mix of all three, but a good mix. That's usually the line that I give the patients. Um, and then we talk about more of what a day-to-day -day looks like there um, in addition to discussing their medical goals. So our patients uh, usually wake up anywhere between like 7 and 8 in the morning. This gives them time to get their vital signs checked before they go down to breakfast. After breakfast, they, you know, get their medicines. They'll go out to appointments with their van driver and occasionally with accompaniment if they need it. Um, they'll get different wound care done. They'll meet with me or one of the other practitioners, um, usually at least twice a week, but sometimes up to five days a week. They have access to recovery meetings if they desire, both our in-house recovery program and as well as AA meetings, which are hosted in the facility. They also have um, access to activities. We have a usually a year-long volunteer activities coordinator who will help plan on-site activities, much like the one we discussed and you discussed, and um, also some off-site um, visits to the many things that DC has to offer for folks. We have a fully staffed kitchen, so we provide three meals a day plus a snack at bedtime. Um, as well as can work with, to a certain extent, certain um, diet restrictions like period diets, et cetera, um, as needed for medical issues that might arise. We also have a um, great administrative team that helps support the, the respite work as well as uh, facilities management as well. And then as a practitioner, um, a full-time practitioner there, my hours are Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, D, for DC, we have built outpatient visits for respite. So like I said, I um, bill usually two to five times a week depending on what's going on. Um, and we do MAT services as well as try to catch people up on primary care. I also like to say it's slow medicine at its best because we can do your vaccines one day and uh, work on your hypertension the next day. Um, and it really is a great way to build relationships with folks. Great. That was a lovely transition because my next question for all of you is to share just more about your role and kind of what the work looks like day to day for you all in the position that you're in um, as folks who are in different, different capacities in the program. Um, I think in addition to what I already shared, I'd like to add to that we are very much a team-based model. So that we have case managers on staff, um, addictions counselor on staff, and chaplain for anybody who's interested on staff, and we meet weekly in team meetings to discuss plans of care, including length of stay, um, any, any ways that we can you know, kind of come together to support folks. And then we also have access to psychiatric services once a week through Unity Healthcare with a partnership that we have with the psychiatrist that works there. So we are a very small team. Um, so we wear a lot of different hats. Um, when they took me on as program director, it was partly in an effort to increase our um, social work providers, so that doubled the number of licensed social workers we had at Joseph's house in, to recognize the importance of behavioral health um, and providing effective medical respite care. Um, so my role ranges from a lot of administrative tasks, um, including staffing issues, um, hiring, um, fundraising, day-to-day um, -day operations, but um, one of the great pleasures is that um, 
we work out of the house where people are receiving care. So it's also the direct service of working with um, the individuals who are living at Joseph's house or who come by for services. So um, as needed, I might be working, doing a case management meeting. Um, I might be stepping in to take someone to an appointment um, because it was, we have an unexpected gap um, might just be kind of sitting and having a conversation with folks in the living room or running, running a group session. Um, and I'm also quite involved in sort of like intake processes and assessments. So I am not quite as fancy as uh, these two folks up here, um, but much like Lita, I am pretty heavy administratively. Um, I, I do also have an HCH program that I have to manage as well. Um, I feel like the, the biggest thing that I have to do in my day is make sure that I support my team uh, and make sure that they have the things that they need as much as possible. Uh, I'm looking to Levi for some affirmation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, but really, that's, that's the most that I can do, um, uh, is really make sure that they have everything they need. Um, you know, it, it's not uncommon uh, for me to get asked uh, for my credit card so someone can go get a rollator or a walker or uh, some random thing I've never heard of from CBS. <laughs> um, uh, it, it also looks like just paying the bills, uh, like transportation and uh, making sure that referrals are, are paid for, uh, referrals to specialists are covered. So uh, pretty uh, administrative heavy. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of uh, thinking about ways to re-engage with the, with the hospital system. Um, our largest hospital system uh, merged a few years ago and now they're just monstrous. Uh, I was reading some stats earlier today and they are in 21 counties uh, in, our, in our humble little state. So they are massive and it's hard to know who to, who to talk to at the top. But we need to figure that out um, because while it's uh, convenient for them to uh, send us the referrals and send us the folks that they no longer want, um, there's a cost to us. And it would be really helpful um, if we could expand past our humble little 10 beds to cover more of that need that we know is, is there and so important. Um, so yeah, and then a lot of uh, community uh, meetings to make sure that folks in the community and the different coalitions uh, know who we are, know what we do. Um, and it also looks like talking to the team sometime when I have these crazy ideas. Hey, we need to do this. Hey, we need to figure out how to do um, community referrals, as an example. And really trying to get their input uh, and feedback on how we can move forward in a way that makes sense because they are the actual real boots on the ground. And again, the, the best job that I, I can do, in my opinion, is to make sure that they're fully supported by me and that they have the tools and the resources that they need to do their jobs effectively. So we're lucky enough that we know these folks all very well. So we have the next 20 to 30 minutes for questions from you all for these folks about the program, their operations, um, whatever that might be. So do we have a microphone runner? Awesome. So yeah, there, I see one in the back. I'll start. Um, so uh, primarily our referrals currently come from the hospitals. Um, we are, there are two main hospitals. We are starting to see a little bit of traffic from hospitals in other counties. Right now, because our program is so small, uh, we only, we say, we say in public, we only cover the one county. Um, but we want our beds to be full. So we take them from wherever we can get them. Um, <clears throat> which is different because our Healthcare for the Homeless program actually covers 13 counties. So trying to navigate that in a way that makes sense can, can be a challenge. Um, in terms of 
how the intake process works. We have a referral uh, form that we have the, the discharge planners at the hospitals complete. Um, in a perfect world, the way that would work is they identify someone appropriate in the hospital. They say, oh, hey, we remember the respite team. We have their forms. They would fill that out. Um, they would send us the appropriate um, discharge notes and, and things related to what the person needs to be discharged or respite for. Um, and we would uh, get that information. Nurse Levi and our social worker would review that information, make a determination uh, if that person is going to be a fit, not only for uh, uh, the level of care that we can provide, but can they navigate the building that we live in? Um, things like that. Um, how it works in reality <laughs> is uh, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of communication primarily with, with Levi, but also with the social worker of we'll get bits and pieces and Levi is pretty good about making sure. The challenge is one hospital system we do have a sharing agreement with so we can at least look at those medical records. The other hospital, we don't. So it kind of depends on where we get those referrals from as to how, uh, how challenging it might be to make a, a really full uh, assessment of the person. We do the best we can, um, but we have uh, visited um, all of the three hospitals that we primarily focus on. They have all of our information, um, names, addresses, et cetera, fax numbers. Um, one thing that we, that we did for the benefit of the discharge planners is we created a, um, a double-sided brochure, if you will, that's slightly longer than regular um, notebook or regular paper, what is it, eight and a half by 11. So ours is a little bit longer, the idea being that uh, if they just happen to throw it under a stack of papers, it's still going to be sticking up, so you can't miss us. You can't miss us. And, and but in all seriousness, um, it has a, kind of a, a, a quick reference for what our at least what most of our criteria is, so they can have that you know ready at their hands uh, if they forget or if they need a refresher. Um, and then and then it also has our, our information, phone numbers, fax numbers, things like that and refers them back to the referral form. So that's, that's pretty much how it works for us. Uh, and, and I'll just say very quickly, once we make a determination if someone's gonna fit, be a good fit for the program, then we work with the hospitals to make sure that transportation is set up. If someone is um, needing uh, something like um, home health, making sure that the hospital sets that up because the hospital has the money to set that up. Um, <laughs> making sure that they send them with, with the appropriate medications. Um, while I do think that it is an advantage for us to be uh, 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 de basically a department within an FQHC, it's still hard for us to get our own patients on the schedule sometimes. So we need uh, at, at least some medication to hold over until we can get them in with one of our providers. But um, typically that's how it works. And then once the patient gets to uh, the respite center, um, uh, Nurse Levi and the social worker will meet with that patient and then kind of go over everything that they need to know about our side, about the shelter side, and then go from there. Um, we have plenty in common with that process. Um, I would say that right now on our most recent analysis, about 50% of our referrals came from hospitals. Um, we've been doing a push to receive referrals from other um, sources. So the other 50%, a good number of those are from clinics, but they're also from low barrier shelters and day programs, yeah. mental health providers. Um, and then we do receive some just self-referrals. Um, for, I think part of thinking about how to become more accessible for non-medical providers is thinking about the language that you use and the, um, what you require from them. Um, because we were using a lot of sort of technical language around what we were looking for, for um, to confirm eligibility. And so part of it was reworking how do we communicate what we need to confirm elig eligibility. 
And another piece was becoming a little bit more available to the other providers to support them through the process of gathering that information. So for a hospital, it's really easy to put to, to grab labs or to get, grab an HMP or relatively easy, but for a case manager at a day program, that might be very unfamiliar. Um, and so you're wanting to be available to answer questions. Um, we found that with um, increasing our referrals from non-medical sources, um, we were increasing the number of referrals we received that were not eligible. So we're also working on our outreach materials to make that clearer for individuals as well. So we're putting together like a decision tree, one pagers, things like that, that just really clearly <coughs> represent um, who might be a good fit for us as a resident, and then viewing those relationships with other case managers as longer term, so that someone might refer someone who's not a great fit, but that's the start of a conversation for who is a good fit, and who is someone who'd be eligible for the program. Um, so after we kind of get a first contact, and that could be through email, phone, fax, um, through um, our main line, or through any individual staff member's email address, um, we would kind of pull it within our um, intake team, which includes our nurse, um, social worker, and myself, and um, we go through the process of collecting the eligibility materials, um, but we also include a step in which we have a site visit with the individual, um, either at the hospital, at the day program they go, they're welcome to come to Joseph's house, but we also go to them to whatever, whatever is most convenient for them so that we can talk about the program, talk about what their goals are, and make sure that we're a good fit for each other. Um, before kind of moving to intake. Sometimes we'll have um, folks where that conversation needs to happen over phone. Um, we've been accepting more individuals who are compassionate release. We've got kind of a program that's aimed at that population. So those will be phone conversations, but then we'll also go to their hearings so that we can explain what our program is to the judges that are making the determination around compassionate release. So. Again, being a small program, we've got a lot of flexibility about how we approach this process. Um, ultimately, then, it's reviewed by um, the team of social workers and nurses um, to make the determination that that's going to be someone who's going to move into Joseph's house that would be able to provide appropriate care to. I'm just going to pause really quickly, just in case someone doesn't know. Can you explain compassionate release? Um, so compassionate release would be someone who has been incarcerated and is being released due to a medical concern. Um, when we were more traditionally taking in folks, that was often for end of life care. Um, and then in the last, more recently, we've noticed that it's, it's more hospice care, uh, more folks who are coming, who are leaving the, um, the carceral system with treatment options. Um, so we used to accept folks for that hospice care, and now we're kind of also accepting folks for medical respite care from um, at the release. Thank you. We have a referral coordinator who works Monday through Friday, um, and that's their primary job is to take calls from the hospital and do some outreach to different locations. Um, a lot of that back and forth that my colleagues spoke of, and we have nurses who cross cover when that person's on vacation. Um, if it's a, a complicated medical patient, whoever's covering intake might come to me as the practitioner to be like, hey, do we do X, Y, Z type of IV or whatnot um, to get a little bit more feedback. Um, the only real deal breakers for admission um, have to do with safety. So some of the ones that come to mind are is if somebody's in acute alcohol withdrawal where they need a higher level of detox care, um, we can't safely do that on our unit and we're not licensed to do that as well. Um, the second one would be safety around behavioral uh, health or mental health symptoms, making sure that those are in check well enough that folks can live with other people safely themselves and that their roommates, et cetera, feel safe. And um, the third one would have to do with ADLs. We do um, take folks um, who require a lot of assistance with their ADLs and I ADLs, but um, to a certain extent, they have to be able to get themselves out of bed and also transfer into a toilet. That's kind of uh, what we use as a marker, except if we're working with somebody who is in a hospice or palliative end of life, then of course we can, as they get sicker um, and closer to death, we'll help more with their activities of daily living. Um, I always like to say that the best way to get into Christ House is to show up at our door. Uh, we do have practitioners who are covered 24 seven, and so there have been times that I'm on call 
and walking by and actually seeing somebody sit out front, you know, they like have their hospital wristband on and it's like seven o'clock at night on a Saturday night. I'm like, how'd you find out about us? And the hospital will have told them, but they're trying to wait until Monday morning. So we'll take them in then too. So we try to be as flexible as we can within the limitations of safety with our staffing. Great, other questions? Many, many. <laughs> Taryn is the person with microphone power. How often do you return someone to the hospital? Uh, more than I want to. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have an exact number, but I would say that there are times that within a few days we'll have to return someone back because it was a really quick discharge um, and they're not medically stable enough. That said, I'm grateful that we have uh, you know, access to labs, et cetera, so I, I do think we prevent more than some other respites, but I would say it happens more frequently than I like at least once a week, probably. Yeah, I, I would say s similarly, it's, if something comes up that we're not equipped to, to address at Joseph's house, um, folks may go back to the hospital, but then they'll come back to us at discharge. So it wouldn't be the full sort of discharge and in reintake. It would just be, okay, we're gonna coordinate care for you to get this taken care of and then, um, we're going to work with the social workers at the hospital for a pretty immediate discharge back to our program. And I would say for us, I, and I'm gonna look to Nurse Levi to give me the nod on this one, um, but it, it doesn't happen too often, it does happen. Um, I, I think one of the reasons, it, like some of my colleagues up here, why it doesn't happen as, as more often as in some other places is because in addition to our admission process, one of the things that we do, and we had to learn this the very hard way, we do do kind of a bedside assessment once we made an initial determination from the referral paperwork and reviewed that. We say it looks like a good candidate, now let's go and see them to make sure that they understand what the hospital has told them. Oftentimes it is different, so we clarify that, we clear things up. And then uh, we, we get a really good understanding and perspective uh, on if the patient thinks they're gonna be a good fit. And again, it gives us another opportunity to kind of assess the patient further, so. Face to face helps a lot. Face to face helps a lot. They do not tell you everything. And they don't send all the paperwork, so, yeah. What is the length of stay in the programs and also are extensions provided and if they are provided, what's the process for that? Um, so our average length of stay for, for us is about four to six weeks. This was a challenge in, in the very beginning because I think somewhere uh, in, in some uh, training document or something, we made the mistake of saying, oh, rest is, you know, two weeks or less or something like, and our shelter partners really held on to that. And it really made it a challenge because if someone stayed past two weeks, then I would get a phone call or, hey, Brandon, you know, Bill is still here, what's going on? And I was like, well, cause he still needs to be here. <laughs> it's just that simple. Um, so for us, the average is, is four to six weeks. Um, really, uh, Nurse Levi is gonna be making assessments as he needs. Assessment is probably not the right word. He's going to be keeping an eye on folks. Um, he's going to make sure that they're connected with their primary care provider. It's going to be a conversation. Oftentimes, I'll hear, uh, oddly enough, in our office, the, the mobile unit provider uh, is right across from my office, and Nurse Levi is right next door. So oftentimes, I will hear him go over and, and kind of chat up the provider and say, hey, this is what's going on. What do you think? Um, and if someone needs to stay a little bit longer, they stay a little bit longer. The, our shelter partners really have learned not to really get too involved with how long we keep someone um, or how quickly we discharge someone. Um, I think they're, they're really starting to understand that um, they're just holding the beds for us and, and we need to be able to use them how we need to use them. And I'll pause there. Um, and I mentioned we, we tend to have folks with us for a longer period of time than many other respite bed programs. So we start at a 90 day um, stay. We do have two different sort of levels of stay with us. We've got 
um, a floor that receives a lot more of the hands-on 24-7 um, care, and we have units that are sort of more like transitional housing units as pe people are becoming more independent, as we then make arrangements for them to move to either longer-term transitional options or to permanent housing. I think I mentioned earlier, our average length of stay is 33 days, but that doesn't actually give a lot of good data because we have some folks who come just for a night, they'll come like the day before their colonoscopy to prep because they need a bathroom and then we'll give them a ride home after and they'll sometimes leave that, that very day or the next day. Um, we've had other folks that end up staying with us for years, including several hospital transfers and back with coordinating. Um, and th those folks tend to be those who are older and more vulnerable, who are undocumented and can't get into long-term care. So it really depends. And we, as I mentioned, meet weekly in a team to decide how long somebody is going to um, stay at the respite. So we're at least every week talking about how long somebody's going to stay. Next question. between 30, 14 to 30 days, how do, you know, what does the funding look like? Because I would assume, especially, maybe not even just for smaller agencies, but the outcomes are better, right? The longer that we can keep them and, and, and provide those wraparound services. So how does that work for, is it Joseph's house? Yeah, so one of the reasons why we're able to do the longer stay is our funding structure. Um, we receive HOPLA funds, which can be, um, we can keep someone for up to two years under HOPLA. Um, and then a lot of our other funding is through um, foundations, through grants. And so we've got a lot of flexibility in how long we um, keep individuals for. We don't do any um, reimbursed services. Can you repeat that? Is it HOPLA funds? HOPLA, so H-O-P-W-A, that's um, one of our major sources of funding, and then a lot of um, grants. Thank you. Far side over here. Thanks, Taryn. I was just curious if any of your programs have mastered how to care for the uh, intravenous drug use history patient requiring prolonged IV antibiotics. Hosp hospital, by the way, just so you know. I don't know if mastered is the right word, but <laughs> I don't know if anyone would describe it that way, but. We have not mastered it. Uh, <laughs> we, I, I would actually say that Christ House within the last several years has become more open to taking any folks on IV antibiotics, um, which I'm really grateful for. We have not mastered it. It's really case by case and um, usually requires them being set up with outpatient home nursing to help support us with like getting the antibiotics and any lab <coughs> that might be necessary. Um, but we're trying. Yes, and I'm, I'm not on the medical side, but um, I believe that it's still a, a, a challenge for us. Yes, there is no mastery here. Um, <laughs> much like Christ House, uh, that, that's typically not some, some, someone that we would typically take into our program. I will, I'm gonna do two things. One, our, one of our virtual site tours later this afternoon, and our panel following that does do IV antibiotics, so we might pin that question and come back to it later, but I will also invite anyone in the audience from a program that does do IV antibiotics if you have any tips. Omar, I see your hand. See one more handle. We're piloting a program here in Baltimore to have people who inject um, who also do antimicrobials to actually go and stay in a residential um, center for addiction and then to have a home infusion company come into that residential center for addiction so they don't have to choose between which of their treatments is going to take priority. So they wouldn't be in that process. 
I will also plug, and then we'll jump to the next question, because I know we will talk about this with our friends at Greater Portland Health this afternoon. Um, there are a couple of studies that have been done out of Seattle Edward Thomas House. They're research studies that worked with folks with a, a comprehensive team of substance use providers um, that go to medical respite for six to eight week IV antibiotic use and through a harm reduction model. So that's a resource that we can send out to you guys as if you're into reading research, it is a research article, um, but had really excellent outcomes from that particular model. So um, there are different levels of folks that are doing it, and it is definitely requires, a, a, I think, a special set of services and structure within your program to be able to support folks well. So we'll see that a little bit later today. But that is also something if your program is wanting to expand to um, is a great, reach out to us and we can provide some support and connect you with some of the folks that in the field that we know are doing it too. So. Um, I see a question back here. Many questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just curious. Um, I missed maybe in the beginning how, how many beds like each of your facilities has, and then um, just a, like a staffing question about that kind of if if there's any information there about kind of like what um, kind of like appropriate staffing ratios for like just non-clinical and also like nursing staffing and kind of. How, how you guys have gotten to the size you're at, whether it's kind of meeting a certain need, I'm sure, or, or just kind of like uh, functionally. So for us, we have 10 beds across two uh, sites that are uh, in emergency shelters. Um, the, <laughs> the staffing, um, we, we just kind of did it based on the number of beds when we started. Uh, which we started with six. And so for us, it made sense to have a nurse and a social worker. We added four beds. And at times when it, when it gets to be full, it might feel like a lot, but currently, um, I, I think the, the staff that we have now is, is fully capable of handling uh, what we have right now. He's good. He's good. <laughs> So we max at eight beds, um, but we also provide support to about 25 community members. Um, so our team, we have two full-time nurses. Um, they are on call for nights and weekends. Um, we have a full-time social worker and we have um, community care aides that are providing a lot of the hands-on support and the maintenance for the house. Um, and we have at least um, one community care aide on shift at a time. Um, for times that are going to be a little bit busier, we might have two community care aides on shift. Um, or if we have a lot of um, residents who have a lot of hands-on needs, we may um, have two community care aides. We are 33 beds all on one floor in a building. Um, they're shared rooms and for staffing, just for the respite, not including any administrative or facilities, we usually have about two nurses on during the day, one in the nights um, and weekends, about one or two nursing assistants on at a time, and two full-time case managers, nine to five. There are several practitioners. Um, I work Monday through Friday, as I mentioned, and then there's several who work as needed or maybe a shift a week, um, and we rotate call for both medical and behavioral issues that come up. And we also have a couple support people, the intake coordinator I mentioned, and somebody who helps with like scheduling appointments for folks and um, managing a kind of our nurse's desk. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm trying to get one question in for a lot of things. I have, I'm a, a primary care provider in New Orleans uh, where respite care, medical respite care for unhoused people, persons in our community um, is being retrofitted. So it doesn't necessarily exist yet. Um, and so I'm going to be utilizing all this information to um, try and gather some players to actually, and, the, and they are, they're, we're doing something they call respite, but it's not really. Um, so we're getting, I work out of a facility for a um, everyone's nodding. A lot of people in here are nodding and saying, oh, um, uh, I work for a, a health care for the homeless FQHC that's housed inside of a shelter that has a medical transition program um, that was supposed to be for its program participants. 
um, but that facility employs no medical provider. So how they did a medical transition program without a medical provider is interesting um, with United Healthcare. But um, uh, um, I, I was wondering, uh, as I'm sitting here trying to retrofit this into a real respite program, um, what advice you might give for um, making this a more concrete situation because what's happening now as you all have expressed, uh, the universe um, in New Orleans in, of, of uh, healthcare um, facilities, uh, this place has become the dumping spot. So they drive them up and drop them off, right? And then me as a provider um, familiar with a number of healthcare settings is like, yeah, no, this is inappropriate. Uh, Y'all are dumping. This is, this is like against the law, actually. But... Um, so what advice would you say, where would you, where would you, um, in your experience, um, advise, say, um, to make this a more concrete uh, resolution to providing care? Uh, it seems as though, too, um, I noticed that hospice is a completely separate kind of staying away from respite, uh, and so I don't think there's too many instances where the two meet. So could you just comment any way you like? Um, we do both medical respite and hospice care at Christ House. I think if I'm understanding your situation, it seems like there are some beds in a shelter and there's an FQHC clinic in the shelter as well where you were working. And no, not working, but there's that. Um, there, I've seen it happen um, in DC in some of the, the shelters there through Unity Healthcare where the FQHC clinic has um, provided the medical services for the beds that are part of the respite. And again, because DC we built outpatient visits, that's a very easy thing. It just kind of limits the, the medical visits to whenever the clinic is staffed though. Um, and I never feel guilty sending somebody back to the hospital who cannot safely be in the hospital, and I never feel guilty picking up the phone to call the person who thought they were safe to be discharged to let them know why I don't think so. Um, because it's just like the human thing to do. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm not afraid to send folks back to the hospital until they can safely come to respite care, which is probably why we call the ambulance more than I wish we had to. I don't know that I have anything else to add. That was a really good answer. Um, no, no, I think that's it. It was a good answer, it really was. Yeah. yeah. So I think we'll do our last question. I don't know, Taryn, who you wanna bestow the mic to? I, I do, but there, I feel like there was one separate part about the hospice respite separation, which I just wanna plug that we are breaking into small groups and end of life care, we'll be meeting here. So if you wanna talk about that more, we'll be doing that. Um, a question for all of you, Do, are any of you licensed to provide a, a given level of care? License, personal care, assisted living. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think as such. <laughs> no is the short answer. The, the little bit more technical answer is I believe the building itself, the second floor where the patients stay, is licensed as a boarding house. We do have a clinic licensure through Unity Healthcare on the first floor, and then also all of the medical people who practice are Unity Healthcare employees, including myself. Um, the kitchen is licensed as a restaurant, and then some of us actually live on site um, to help augment the 24 hour provision of services in private apartments on the third and fourth floor, and those are licensed as apartments. That was a very helpful technical answer. Um, I was gonna say that's a complicated answer because it's so specific to community zoning and requirements and state, and it's very hard, it's a very hard question to answer quickly, so that was, super helpful but yeah I think a lot of it in your community is calling your Department of Health and then 
for all of those pieces, right, the food piece and the healthcare provision piece, and, you know, some facilities are licensed as emergency shelters and some are assisted living, and there's a lot of variety, I think, because it is so dependent on what exists in the community and the level of care being provided and medical care, all of that sticky, sticky stuff. There's, I don't know if any, if this is anybody's first time here, I think you're learning that the first answer is, well, it depends, and then we'll go ahead and talk more about what that can potentially look like. Um, so I'm gonna plug a couple of things. First, I wanna say we have a new resource out that is fresh off the press, just got published on our website, I think on Wednesday, um, Potential Skills and Staffing Models of Medical Respite. So Lori mentioned the models of care earlier. That's a resource also available that really just describes what the different types of medical respite care look like um, in terms, and that's really describing, describing intensity of like medical clinical services provided. So now it has a partner document that talks about what are the skills that are needed to do that model of care and potential staffing that could do that, right? So there's a lot of different roles and skills that can be fulfilled by different types of staff and providers. So there's not a perfect model, but hopefully this will help identify what are the skills that we need to be able to provide care safely and of quality, depending on the care that we're, we're giving in our respite, and then who might that staff be. It does not have a recommended number of staffing or staffing ratio, um, because there's not data for us to say what that would be. And again, it is so specific hospice care, IV, antibiotic care is a very different level of care needed than folks who maybe are doing wound care that have home health coming to support that, right? So that's why that recommendation is not in there. But it's a new resource. We hope that you guys will look through it and use it as you're thinking about these things. So um, thank you so much to our panelists. We really appreciate your insight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Samantha, who's gonna talk about our small group discussions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Caitlin said, my name is Samantha, and I am a coordinator on the medical respite team. And we often joke that my role is like herding cats. And today, you all are now my cats for this session. <laughs> so contain your excitement, please. Um, we have some small group discussion topics posted around the room, and we are going to have an RCPN um, steering committee member at each of the stations to facilitate these small group discussions. Um, you can go to whichever one speaks to you and it could be something that you have no knowledge of or something that you want to um, kind of share your expertise with your with your peers. Um, so if I could have the steering committee members come up. And then if you want to choose which group you are interested in, then we will get a representative over to you. And we will have until 2.30 for this. <laughs> 